In this series of videos, we are going to discuss how to name ionic and molecular compounds, starting with ionic. Before starting on this material, you need to make sure that you know how to tell the difference between ionic and covalent compounds. We won't cover it in detail here, but if you can't do that, then you need to go back to the video and learn how. We will be covering naming ionic compounds in this particular video. In order to do that, you must also have your polyatomic ions memorized, and generally also need to know the charges of common ions. From here, from here we will be able to put these together to name the ionic species. In the next videos, we'll cover the naming of acids in covalent compounds. The very first step in naming is to categorize the compound. We name acids differently from ionic compounds and from covalent compounds. If it has a charge, it's an ion, and it's named according to the ion. We'll talk about this in the middle of ionic nomenclature. From here, if something is neutral, it may be an acid, a covalent compound, or an ionic compound. Let's start with ionic. Ionic compounds are made from a metal and a nonmetal. The formula for how this is named is the name of the cation followed by the name of the anion. Let's look at some examples of this to expand out on this overly simplistic explanation. Ionic nomenclature is generally considered the most complicated, which is mainly due to the high degree of memorization it requires. We'll only cover ionic in this video, and then we'll cover acids and covalent in two separate videos. Let's start with the simplest. If both the anion and the cation are monoatomic ions, then you just need to name the first element, then name the second element, and then add an IDE to the end. For each of these, take a moment and see if you can get the name before I say it. Pause the video and write these down, and then hit play when you're ready. For the first one, KCl is potassium cation and a chlorine anion. This gives us potassium chloride. For the second one, we have MgF2. Magnesium is a plus two ion, fluorine is a minus one ion. To balance these charges, we must have two fluorines for every one magnesium. However, as chemists, we know that we must have these balanced charges, and so we don't have to account for the charges in the nomenclature. It's automatic because of the charges on the ions. And so this name is very, very similar to the first one, even though there are two fluorines for every one magnesium. This is called magnesium fluoride. Now let's add in a typical complication. Often one or both ions are polyatomic. This means that more than one atom makes up the ion. I've given you a list of every one of these that you should know in the Word document online. It doesn't actually complicate the naming that much. Once you have the list memorized, you're all set, ready to go, and you just fill in the name. However, the memorization itself is quite arduous. Let's do two examples. Because you don't have them all memorized yet, I'm going to tell you the name of the polyatomic ion. For the first one, we have for the first one, we have NH4Cl. I tell you that NH4 is ammonium. Pause and try to name this before moving on. This becomes ammonium chloride, just like in our potassium chloride example. Now the next one. Try this one before listening to the answer. Here we have sodium, Na, and sulfate, which I tell you is SO4. Combining this together, we get sodium sulfate. Now, of course, this feels simple because I'm giving you the name of the ion. But once you get the memorization, it's really just filling in the blanks. So now let me help you out a bit with the memorization. To cut the memorization required significantly, you can recognize that there are pairs. For instance, sulfate and sulfite, phosphate and phosphite. For all of these pairs, the I-T-E ending has one less oxygen than the A-T-E ending. This cuts the memorization down a lot because you only need to memorize one section. Just memorize the A-T-E endings and you'll know that the I-T-E endings are one less oxygen. This is in the Word doc as well, but just quickly make sure that you know all of these. This is in the Word doc as well, but I just wanted to look at it real quickly to let you know that you need to make sure that you know all of these. 
these are the ones that are testable and it's expected that you know nearly universally. I would not suggest working on the ionic nomenclature until you have these memorized. Now let's talk about another type of complication that can arise. Many of the transition metals have two different forms. The different charges need to be accounted for in the nomenclature so that we know what species we are discussing. To do this, we can do two different things. We can either use the standard nomenclature that you're used to and put the charge in parentheses, or we can use the older names of the elements and change the ending to an IC ending for the higher charge and an OUS ending for the lower charge. Let's do two examples to show you how this works. Take a moment and try these on your own and see if you can get them before moving on to the answer. For the first one, we need to first decide what charge it is. We do this by looking at the chlorine. We know that chlorine is a negative one charge. This means that to be balanced, the copper must be a plus two charge. For copper, this is the higher charge. We can then name it the two ways. We can do this with Roman numerals, calling it copper two chloride, or we can do it with the IC ending, calling it cupric chloride. Now let's look at the next one. Check your answer or try it for the first time if you haven't already. This is tin, and by using chloride, we can tell that it is a plus two charge tin. This is the lower charge of tin, so we call it tin two chloride, or we can name it with the OUS ending and call it stannous chloride. You may use either one of these if I ask you for the name. However, you must be able to recognize both if I give you the name and ask you for the formula. Now let's do some examples. Take a moment and try these on your own before playing the rest of the video. For the first one, I've now given you the name and asked you to find the formula. The ferric shows us that it is a higher charged version of iron because of the IC ending. And so it is Fe3+. The sulfate shows us that we have an SO4 2 minus. From here, we need to combine these in a way that makes the species neutral. We'll crisscross down the charges, which is our easy way of finding the lowest common multiple, to give us our subscripts. This gives us Fe2 SO4 3. Notice that the SO4 is in parentheses because the 3 belongs to the entire ion. For the next one, we will notice that this is the plus two version of tin, which is the lower charged version. We then have a phosphate ion. So when we combine these, we can get two different answers. Tin two phosphate, if you want to do it with the Roman numerals, or use the OUS ending to give us stannous phosphate. For the third one, we now have two polyatomic ions, but it doesn't fundamentally change the process. We have ammonium, or NH4+, and sulfite, or SO3-. For here, we'll crisscross down our charges to balance our charges to neutral to give us NH4-2 with the ammonium in parentheses, SO3. And that wraps up our ionic nomenclature.